President uh, Duell. I do believe that I must be, what, the sixth, seventh, eighth speaker today. Uh, it's quite refreshing because a few weeks ago I was invited to a dinner in London where I discovered upon arrival that I was the 14th speaker. There must have been about 200 odd people in the room, but by the time we got to the eighth speaker, there were about 55 left. By the time it got to the 12th speaker, there were about 10 left. And when I rose to speak, which was after midnight, there were precisely two people left in the hall. But I made my speech. And when I finished, I stepped down and asked the first fellow, why on earth did you stay? And he said, I'm your Scotland Yard security officer. <laughs> and when I asked the second fellow, why did you stay? He said, I'm the last speaker. <laughs> Dr. Jordi, friends all, distinguished members of the dais, my fellow honorees, I'm humbly grateful for the high honor you do me today, and I pay tribute to you, the graduation class of 2012, to you and to your families, as you, <laughs> as you enter the next phase of your hard-earned scholastic achievements. Indeed, if there be a religious aristocracy in the Jewish world today, I am looking at it now. You have imbibed the Torah Umada Scholarship of Yeshiva University. You, an educated elite of our people, steeped in the knowledge that wherever we Jews have gone in history, whether in agony, in prayer, in hope, in tragedy or in triumph, we have always followed our own way, deeply involved in the paths of history but never swallowed up by them, forever belonging to and contributing mightily to world civilization and yet remaining distinct from it, forever proclaiming with pride and with dignity, I am a Jew, Yehudi Anochi. <clears throat> no wonder it is that I meet more graduates of Yeshiva University than with Israel than from any other academic institution in the world. Yes, it was 64 years ago, in this season of the year that I arrived in Eretz Israel from my native England. I was but a lad of 17, fired by an inextinguishable fervor to fight the British for a Jewish state. And I soon found myself swept up in a situation without knowing what I had let myself in for. I had no idea that the initial skirmishes in which our underground militia, the Haganah, was engaged would be so ferociously escalate into an all-out struggle for survival. It might sound heroic today, but it was not then, on that Friday night of May the 14th, 1948, Hey Iyar when the British evacuated the country and our war of independence began. For three consecutive days and nights, we, an inglorious bucket brigade of some 20 underfed thirsty diggers, desperately fortifying a narrow sector of besieged Jerusalem, hacking out trenches on the mountainside, 
Many of you will know that mountainside. It is where Yad Vashem now stands, overlooking the village of Ein Karim. Our only weapons were a dozen World War I rifles. And rumor had it that a Jordanian brigade was coming up from Jericho to launch an offensive that very night, and we were supposed to stop them. But none of us knew how. With 12 obsolete rifles and a motley untrained crew like ours, what we were, were we supposed to do? One insuperable problem was our lack of communication with the outside world. We hadn't the slightest idea of what was going on. So our commander, a fellow called Elisha, instructed one of our lot, a, whose name was Leopold Mahler, he instructed him, Mahler, a violinist and grandnephew of the composer Gustav Mahler, he instructed him to scout out the land to see what he could dig up. By the time he returned, it was close to midnight. And he came crawling into our trench, waving a bottle of wine and shouting, Yeshli Chadashot, Yeshli Chadashot, I have news. And he told us that David ben Gurion had indeed declared independence that afternoon in Tel Aviv and that the Jewish state would come into being at midnight. There was dead silence. Midnight was minutes away. And then we cheered and we embraced and we pumped hands until Elisha called out, Hey, Mala! Ma Medina Shalanu! Ma Shem Shala! Our state, what's its name? And Mala stared back at him blankly and said, I don't know. I didn't think to ask. How about Yehuda, suggested one. After all, King David's kingdom was called Yehuda. No, cried another. Zion, Zion, it's obvious, will be called Zion. And what's wrong with Yisrael, asked a third. To which Elisha, grabbing hold of a tin mug and filling it with wine, which Marla had ferreted that bottle of wine, he said, let's drink a lechaim to our Jewish state, whatever its name. Whereupon? A chosid in our unit. Oh yes, in those days, Haredim served in the army. <laughs> a chosid in our unit, whom we all knew as Reb Nusen the Chazan. He cried out, wait, it's Shabbos. Let's make Kiddush first. And so we crouched around Reb Nusen the Chazan in the trench as he began to chant a sweet and melodious Kiddush Yom Hashishi. And as he finished Mekadesh HaShabbat, he swayed back and forth, back and forth, and voice trembling, he declared, Shechianu v'kimanu v'giyanu azmanase. But then the mortars from Enkarim pounded the hillside and it was all dust and debris and fear and carnage and the price we paid for our freedom turned out to be appalling. We Jews fought alone. Nobody helped us. This is why year after year after year on Yom HaZikaron, thousands of families, mine among them, gather in military cemeteries across the country to weep over our individual plots of grief. It was as if we had composed our Declaration of Independence with our own skin as a parchment, our own blood as the ink, and our own skulls as the ink wells. I was too young then to realize the enormity of what was happening, that we were embarked on a revolution which for us, the Jewish people, was no less earth-shattering than the American Revolution, perhaps even more so. I dare say that. 
I dare say perhaps even more so. Because for centuries we Jews have been nothing but an object of history, meaning that others always made the decisions about our fate for us. Came Israel's rebirth 64 years ago. And from that day forth, we once again, all of us, became a subject of history, meaning that we became responsible for our own destiny in accordance with our own needs, our own will, and our own choice. This is why I believe with all my heart that Israel's six million shall forever be the custodians of the voices of those other six million. It is why I believe that the birth of Israel saved the Jewish people from appalling decline, if not oblivion after the Shoah. It is why I believe that the Jewish state performed the historic mission of national rescue in liberating and redeeming and rehabilitating our scattered brethren wherever they were downtrodden. It is why I believe that the renewed Jewish sovereignty intuitively released a regenerative energy that has invigorated the Renaissance, which has pulsated throughout the whole of the, our people. It is why I believe that the Jewish state has provided the infrastructure of the largest center of Torah scholarship in the world, whose influence is felt throughout the world. It is why I believe that for many Jews today, perhaps the majority, their Jewish identity is unalterably bound up with the fate of Israel. And it is why I believe be'emunah shlema shalo yanum v'lo yishan shomer Yisrael that the guardian of Israel shall never rest nor slumber in watching over his people. So, if you ask me, as no, as no doubt many of you ask yourselves, the way things are going, my year, what's going to be? And essentially, I would have to tell you in all honesty, I don't know. And do you know what? We've never known. Many an American who has a measure of certainty about his future will assuredly find this hard to understand, to understand the capacity of a nation to live with the unknown. Yet the essence of all of Jewish history ever since God commanded Abraham Avinu, Lech Lecha, go, set out for the unknown. The essence of our people has been the capacity to live with the unknown. The entire venture of Israel has been achieved only by jumping into the unknown. In no case, under no circumstance, at no period to no Israeli prime minister has the future been clear and known. So, given these unknowns, I humbly offer to you, to you, the graduation class of 2012, I offer, offer you 10 commandments, my own versions, designed to meet the political unknowns of our times. And they are these. One, when an enemy of our people says he seeks to destroy us, believe him. Two, stand tall in the knowledge that every tyrant in history who has ever sought our destruction has himself been destroyed. Three, protect Jewish dignity and honor at all costs. Yes, life is holy, but there are times when one must risk life for the sake of life itself, for never, 
ever lays a hand against a fellow Jew, no matter the provocation. Five, give the enemy no quarter in demolishing his malicious propaganda. Six, whenever a threat against a fellow Jew looms, do all in your power to come to his aid, whatever the sacrifice. Seven, never pause to wonder what the world will think or say. Eight, be forever loyal to the historic truth that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people and Jerusalem is undivided and eternal capital. <clears throat> Nine, love peace, but love freedom more. And ten, which is really number one. Build Jewish homes, not by the accident of birth, but by the conviction of our eternal Torah. As we celebrate in a few days' time, Chag Matan Toratenu, the festival of Shavuot, I recall a sight. The sight I saw at the Kotel but a short while ago. The sight I saw of a bent old man, accompanied by a strapping young man, a soldier. And judging by the familiarity of their behavior, I gathered they were a grandfather and a grandson. They were deep in conversation when suddenly, for whatever reason, the old man rolled up his sleeve to show the young man the serial number tattooed on his arm, at which the young man undid the top button of his uniform to show the old man the IDF tag number strung around his neck. And there they stood, grandfather and grandson, comparing serial numbers. Auschwitz and Zwarhagana, the Israel. And seeing them comparing those numbers, I thought to myself, this is a story of almost biblical proportions, from the darkest pit to the highest peak, from Shoah to Yeshua, in the space of hardly two generations. And as for myself, I'm just one of very many who made some small contribution to our sovereign rebirth. And for this, I am eternally grateful to the Almighty. Just as the award bestowed upon me this day by the board is one of the greatest privileges of my life. It was the circumstances of the times that challenged my generation to fight for and establish Medinat Israel. And yours, you, the graduation class of 2012, what do the circumstances of your times challenge you to do? I submit they challenge you to be in the vanguard of our people as role models. Why you? Because by the years you have spent here, you have become role models of our people. This is the honest truth. It is the honest truth by virtue of the unparalleled scholarship and values of Torah and Mada, which have, you have imbibed in this unrivaled citadel of Jewish scholastic vision. My dear graduates, these are the best of times. And these are the worst of times. I need not elaborate. Our Jewish people need the likes of you as never before. Indeed, our people need a yeshiva university as never before. 
So yes, assuredly, Yom Zeh Mechubad. This is the day of your distinction. May you, with the Almighty's help, go forth and prosper. Alu v'hatzlichu to you and to your dear families. I extend my heartfelt mazal tov.